All right, so now we're going into steady state flow. We're gonna to try to use flow fields and AI to predict those flow fields, right? So it's like CFD solvers. So CFD is super numerically intensive, right? Computationally expensive too. Memory demanding, time consuming, all of those. Like that's, it's just known. Um, just read something from like, what was it? Like a car company like Toyota. They run a CFD simulation for like two weeks and get a result and have to tweak something and do it again. So you can see how doing something with AI, we're, we're hoping to get the same fidelity as numerical models, but more importantly, just speed this up, right? Because the faster we can do research, the more research we can do. I mean, that's just common sense. And that's really the power of NVIDIA, right? I'm trying to speed things up so you can do groundbreaking research at a way faster pace. So we're not just sitting around waiting. Okay. So we're going to be doing this with neural networks, obviously. And our aim is to predict this 2D flow around an object. The input's the boundary around which we want to calculate the flow. So you can think of it similar setup to a CFD problem where you're building a grid out. And in this example, our input data and the corresponding flow was calculated using the lattice Boltzmann method. So you can click the link in the notebook to that if you really want to read up on that. Um, I don't know much about lattice Boltzmann. I, uh, my undergrad is in aerospace engineering. We did some CFD, but not enough for me to be anywhere talking about it. And again, six step approach, won't get into that any anymore. Don't go over it in the lab again too. So <clears throat> the simulated flow lines were of course used um, from that method I just spoke of and the input data is stored as TF records which will make this large data set a lot easier to be digested into uh, to the memory for the computer. But again, when you're done a notebook, please, please, please shut down your kernel. And we're gonna to try to predict the velocities of both X and Y. So it's like a, um, you know, a 2D regression problem in a sense, right? And we'll be building out this model. So multiple models, and if we get far enough, you'll get into some uh, really cool ones, right? So we'll do a simple, fully connected neural network with three and five layers. You'll look at CNN with binary boundaries and sign distance functions. And then if we get further, and if not, you can do it on your own, of course, gated residual networks and non-gated residual networks. So ResNets, right? So ResNets I spoke of a little bit um, prior. So we didn't have lab for that. Here's our model. And you can see here like this, breaking it down into this 2D approach where we're gonna predict both X and Y. And then something even crazier, right? <clears throat> Is this UNet. Um, I mentioned it, you know, I think Steven had it up on his screen yesterday when he was talking about some of the groundbreaking stuff they're doing there. UNets are super valuable, super important. And they're used a lot in medical image segmentation. Um, but many visual tasks, you know, the desired output should be in, include some kind of localization. So that idea that, you know, that segmentation. So it will be interesting if we get to this, right, on um, this U-gated network, because it would be cool to see how this does, considering it's not a segmentation problem, right? So I hope we do get to get there. And uh, don't be surprised when you see this, right? It's just, just something, something to you know, add on to your repertoire of, of networks to try. So now the fun part, we got to get on this cluster. All right, so we're gonna shut down the lab. And then in your, which terminal? I think in this one. So in the portal access terminal on your browser. All right, we have to launch a new script with the same key and the script is CFD launch script. Let's check. Real quick, excuse me for yawning. Yeah, so we should. And actually, let me see.
So you should kill that job. I don't know why I didn't kill. I should close on the Jupiter. So kill the job that you have that we just did climate in. If you're still working on that and you don't feel like working on CFD because maybe climate's more your type, there's no pressure. You don't have to do the CFD lab right now. Um, but you can only have one job running at a time. So yeah. Did I spell that wrong? What's going on? I just canceled. Anyways, we need to launch the exact same script we did last time, but we want I know I'm doing this, right? There we go. I must have spelled the job wrong. Anyways, so cancel your job that you were on, and then we're going to keep the same key you had today, and you'll go to CFE. Okay, wait a little bit. Yeah, we're still getting things coming in on the challenge too, so that's great. And then, so in my case, port forwarding was deleted with launching a new job, the new script, like uh, Jeremy had mentioned in the Slack. If you are having issues, though, we can always help troubleshoot that. So we're just waiting for that port forwarding, forwarding to come out. And then we'll cat it, we'll launch it from our local machine, like we did last time, and uh, boom, we'll be there. Wait one second. No, we won't get it. That's what it's saying. Okay. So I don't know if Jeremy's online, but it's saying I have to use a different port. Is that common? Okay, if he's not. Anyways, we're gonna go through this and we're gonna figure this out. Okay. So let me change that right here. Everyone bear with us. I'll change it to, oh, that was way too big, laggy. Should be able to see that one. Yeah. So I had to give it a new local host. I just did 808 instead of, I spelled that out there. Fail connection. Oh, man. Oh, 
So if I keep 8888, I can't read it. If I use 8008, it ran it. So wrong thing. Troy, is Jeremy online? Yeah, I'm trying to find him. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. It should work. I don't know if we have to back completely out and get a whole new key to run a whole new job. That shouldn't be the case. So I should be there. Yeah, it's not even humming. So it should just be climate still. Oh, it's there. It's at 8 8. All right. So even though it says you can't. They can't hear it. It just updates the CFD lab. So that's on me, guys. All right. So hopefully everyone followed and didn't change anything. <laughs> if you uh, copied the port, the uh, cat, if you cat port forwarding and then you paste it in your local terminal up here, then it should pop up in the Jupyter lab. We were just saying 8888. Sorry for that confusion on my part. And then here, we'll start here just like we did before. And we'll go to notebook two. And you'll start actually going through um, the approach to the problem, the data and task, you know, what we're going through, what we're actually doing again. A lot more plots in this one, so it's kind of cool to look at. Um, our models and what we're going to be looking at and how we're going to measure the loss. Right, and uh, yeah, I'll let you all go to it. We got an hour left. If anyone has questions, please ask in the, uh, let's see, what did he actually? Asking the cluster support if you're having issues getting that port forwarding. I'm sorry I made it look so complicated. It was pretty simple. I should have just checked localhost 8888, where we were before. Um, that's on me, so I do apologize. But again, remember, shut down your kernels, okay? Super important. Shut those kernels down. And other than that, go at it. Troy, you can take us to our breakout rooms if you want. Awesome. And we actually have about an hour and 15 minutes. Oh, that's um, right. We have Sorry. until 12.15 Pacific time. I know I'm in central time. So <laughs> trying to do math today is just not working. <laughs> um, so you should be thrown back into your breakout rooms from just a little bit ago. And we'll meet back here in about an hour and 15. Great. Thank you. And then the same thing at the, at the end, there's a challenge. Um, so just post it in the thing as, as well as you can get it, okay? All right, welcome back everyone. Um, we're gonna go ahead and uh, kind of briefly talk about what we just uh, went through and then we'll uh, open it up for a little bit of Q&A before we close out. So I'm gonna hand it back to Caleb. Awesome, thanks, Troy. Yeah, so that was, uh, I don't know, I really like that lab. I think it's pretty cool. Um, get to go through a lot of like real world stuff. Now there's not as many questions in the lab section as before, there was a few. One of the big ones um, that we had in my section was, you know, why did we go, I think it's in part three. Yeah, why did we go from a 2D convolutional network and down to a fully connected layer and then scaled back up to a convolutional network? Two different ones, right? To get the X and Y component. Um, 
Yeah, it's pretty interesting for sure. But that that going down to that fully connected layer from a 2D convolutional network happens a ton, right? It's almost like an embedding. You can think of it as an embedding where you're just trying to put together everything you learned from that 2D sense into something that's going to make rationale of it for you, hopefully, you know, learn what the good embedding is. <clears throat> and then transpose it back up to 2, 2D to get those X, Y, X and Y in each of its respective channel. So a lot of good talk. Let's see, there's a couple, there's one um, in the challenge that finished through, so that's great. Um, I'm trying to think, there's not really much to go over. Hopefully everyone got to see the more advanced networks too, and just how much more complicated they are than what we were doing, right? They're pretty, pretty elaborate. You saw a new activation function too, ELU which is the play on leaky relu, right? So instead of having some kind of linear threshold in the negative region, you let that exponentially um, decide and decay. So there's two now, good job. And uh, yeah, so we can just open it right up for questions, Troy. I don't know exactly what to pinpoint through. Um, not too many cluster issues. Sorry again for the challenges we had getting on and the little mess up I had showing you all. Yeah, there's always unique challenges with every single boot camp. So we just happened to find one. <laughs> <laughs> we powered through. Yeah, we did a good job. Everyone did a good job. Thanks to all my TAs too. Yeah, thank you um, to all the TAs and uh, to you, Caleb, as well. And Jeremy, I, I can't do the, my job without you guys. Um, so if anyone's got questions, I've given you the ability to unmute yourselves. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes that we can answer some questions. And I will take that silence as we are ready to begin our weekend. Uh, I just have a general question. Um, is uh, CNN some sort of a black magic or is it some uh, some logic to to that to that uh, madness? It seems that um, people just do stuff. Uh, it's not always clear to me why people do what they do. Yeah, I would say they're not just black magic. I mean, that's a that's a beautiful thing everyone likes to say because they just don't understand what's going on under the hood, right? And it's not just you, that's not me picking on you, but a lot of people say that, higher ups and everything, um, industry, research and all that. I mean, the principle is there, right? So instead of having someone sit there and try to feel, find these features for hours on end, why isn't it a great idea to have your network learn what features make most sense, right? And it's been proven throughout the papers that these different layers learn features that we could never do a handmade crafted kernel um, to extract that from an image, right? So it's pretty powerful. And then, you know, one other thing you could do, say, you know, we always connect these to a fully connected layer at the end, which is just an MLP. So you have a CNN attached to an MLP. You can extract the features from different layers, right? And then send that into your favorite machine learning algorithm, random forest, SVM, Anything like that, if you're not, you know, thinking that MLP is going to give you the performance you want. So that's always something I find really interesting. Anybody else want to take that or? Uh, how do you build a model if you uh, start out with not knowing um, how to extract the features on the different layers? How do you know how many layers to put in there and uh, what kind of layers I want to put in there, that kind of things? Yeah, so if it's like anything with this, right? Due diligence is key. You got to read papers. You got to read what everyone's doing in the community. Um, Google's our best friend, right? If you have an idea and you're like, I wonder if I could do this to make my application better. More than likely, someone else has thought of it too <laughs> or has thought of something similar. And you can use and harness what they did, right? Um, extracting layers. That's pretty simple and, and Keras and PyTorch um, through the API and the frameworks we have to make it again, they try to make it as simple as possible. And then on top of that, 
you know, we talked about it yesterday and seen that layers closest to the input is going to be really those low level features like, you know, edges and blobs and textures. And that's something that if all natural images share similar lines, right, textures and edges, you probably wouldn't use those for a classification um, feature, right? But the higher you go towards the output, those features and those convolutional layers get more distinct, uh, more representative of, you know, higher objects too. So that's something you would use. I, I always see in the papers, VGG is a good one, right? Where they take that, you know, they take that layer right, right before the fully connected layers and use that for future extraction. Um, a lot of the object tracking algorithms that did really well in the VOT challenge, when CNNs were just kicking off, um, they all used VGG features and just took that and, and ran with it. Cool, great questions. All right, Troy. Oh, if I may, I wanted to ask another question. Can I, do we still have time? Yeah, of course. I wanted to ask a question I asked in the breakout, uh, breakout room. So here we use the data generated with this numerical solver, which is very expensive, and we use it, as, use it as input, right? So now let's say we built a model, it's good enough, but now we ask another question. Maybe we can uh, uh, solve, we can, maybe we can generate some other inputs to improve our model. So now the question would be based on our results, can we know what additional shapes should be fit to our like real solver, accurate solver to improve our model? Is there a way to, to do that? You're muted, Caleb. <laughs> Start over. Right. Um, yeah, so that's a good question. Sorry about that. Uh, we, we definitely don't have enough time now, considering I just talked for a minute to myself, um, to really go in depth with that. Yvonne, so the Slack channel is gonna be open. I'd really appreciate it if you asked that in the Slack and then that will give everyone a little bit more time to digest it because it was a pretty long question. And then, um, you know, reflect on it and you'll get a lot more opinions than just mine on that if that's okay. Because it's a really sure. good question. I wanna give it due yeah. diligence. Okay, sure, we'll do that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is IT, can I have a quick question also about general workshop or the boot bootcamp? Can I ask? Yeah. Uh, so when I go to the GitHub repository that was shared for the GPU bootcamp official training materials, I do see, in addition to the CFD and the climate, there's the PINs, Physics Informed Neural Network related material. Is there a separate, like a workshop you are organizing for, you know, looking into the PINs, which will be of interest, so that's why I want to check. Are you try. Yeah, I can take that. So um, earlier this year, we actually ran an AI for Science with all of the content you went through yesterday and today and the pin, we, we call it modulus um, content. And it was just way too, way too much. Um, so we are looking at, I don't know when this will happen, but we will be running a uh, modulus boot camp at some point in the future. Um, I just don't know when that will be. Okay, so uh, the modulus is the what used to be SIMnet, if I remember correctly. Is that the yep. new? Okay, I see. Correct. Okay. And will that be offered, or if it's offered, will that be again through the nurse channel or something else? Um, we don't know. <laughs> okay. We do. We do work with a, a lot of um, labs and and partners around the world, so um, that's yet to be determined. I see. Okay, thank you. But the material is there that at least I can download and just go over, right? There are notebooks and everything? Yep, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Would you mind sharing more details on like uh, which lab are you from and uh, your interest in modulus so that we can get back to you? Sure. Thank you. Thanks. All right, lots of great questions. Uh, so we will go ahead and wrap up for today. Um, again, I wanna thank uh, Caleb, all of my TAs, Jeremy, and all of you for attending. Uh, I think this was a great boot camp. 
Um, I just sent a Slack message and a follow-up email um, that links to the recordings. Uh, Zoom takes a long time to render these videos, um, so please give me until the end of today to get those videos put out there. Um, you do have access to all of the presentation decks, and you also have access to the NVIDIA Curiosity Cluster until Monday. I don't have a specific time, so just do whatever you want to do until Sunday. Um, and then uh, whenever Jeremy logs on on Monday is when we'll, we have to boot you off and uh, prepare for the next event. So thank you all so much for joining and have a great weekend. Bye, everyone. Uh, thank you. Bye. Thanks for organizing this workshop.